the Sorangama Sutra, the reason for continual arisal, Volume 4, Chapter 1, Sutra. Then Purnamayi Jayani Putra arose from his seat in the midst of the great assembly and covered his right shoulder, knelt on his right knee, put his palms together respectfully and said to the Buddha, the most virtuous and awe-inspiring world honored one has for the sake of living beings expounded the primary truth of the first common with remarkable eloquence. Commentary then, after Ananda had finished speaking his verse in praise of the Buddha, Purnamaitya Yani Putra arose from his seat in the midst of the great assembly. Purna Maitreya Yani Putra means a son of fulfillment and compassion. Fulfillment was his father's name, compassion was his mother's name. He immediately stood up. The Buddha's disciples were especially respectful toward him. When he wanted to ask a question, they stood in reverence. He uncovered his right shoulder. In Chinese sash, is tied. The Chinese sash is tied so that it does not cover the right shoulder. In order to represent this gesture of respect, in India, it is never cold, winter or summer, so it was all right to leave the right shoulder completely exposed. One wouldn't get cold, but the climate in China is very cold, and if one's right shoulder were always exposed, it would be easy to catch cold. So, in China, the monks wore clothing under their sashes. This accorded with the climate, the geographical location and the customs in China. The sashes in India did not have a clasp like the Chinese sashes do. Now in India, Burma, Ceylon, and Thailand, where the Theravada teachings are practiced, monks still don't have clasps on their sashes. Why do Chinese sashes have a clasp? This too came about because of the climate of China, for if the monks were clothing inside their sashes, and if there were no clasp to hold the sash in place, it could slip off without their being aware of it. So the patriarchs of China invented the clasp to solve this problem. The sashes of the other countries mentioned above had the same number of pieces, but they lacked the clasp because the climate is so warm and they don't wear clothing under their sashes. If it starts to slip off, they are aware of it since it is next to their skin. After I left the home life, I investigated the question of the clasp on the Chinese sash with a lot of elder Dharma masters and elder monks. I asked them why the monks from other countries did not have a clasp on their sashes why did the Chinese monks and add this thing to their sashes? But they all shook their heads. They didn't know. It's a small matter, but nevertheless, they didn't know. They had never known. In the end, then who told me? No one told me. I just compared the climate in China to that of the other countries and figured out for myself that the first patriarchs who came to China must have invented the clasp to make it more convenient to wear clothes under the sash. When I brought up my opinion, the elder Dharma masters and monks said, Oh, of course, that's how it was. Probably that's how it was, and it was a small question, so no one had stopped to think about it. But I know that Americans like to look into things thoroughly, so now I've explained the origin of the clasp on the Chinese dye sashes without waiting to be asked. Perna uncovered his right shoulder and knelt on his right knee. The monks in present-day Burma and Ceylon have this practice. For instance, if a junior monk sees a senior monk, they he uh, does not stand to talk, but kneels with his right knee on the ground and his palms together. Purna put his palms together respectfully and said to the Buddha, 
the most virtuous and awe-inspiring world on earth one has for the sake of even being disputed the primary truth of the third common with remarkable eloquence he said that the buddha is one of awesome virtue who can subdue all the living beings in the three realms his awesomeness has the power to cause all living beings to submit his virtue moves all living beings so that when they hear his name they change their forms and become good the buddha uses wholesome clever expanding devices to teach and transform living beings he speaks the drama for the sake of living beings he tells them in detail of the primary truth of the third common the sadhakata's most wonderful doctrine sutra the world honored one often singles me out as the foremost among speakers of dharma but now when i hear the wonderful and subtle expression of the dharma i am like a deaf person who at the distance of more than a hundred hundred paces tries to hear a mosquito which in fact cannot be seen let alone heard commentary Pana has just bowed to the Buddha and made a request. Why did he do that? Because he had some doubts. Right now, Ananda doesn't have any doubts, but Pana, first among those who speak Dharma, has given rise to doubts. He is not clear about the Dharma that the Buddha has spoken. Therefore, he says, The world honored one often singles me out as the foremost among speakers of Dharma. You often choose me as the best among those who lecture the sutras and speak Dharma. I, Purna, rank number one. He expresses well the wonderful meaning of all Dharmas. If this sutra were being explained now by Purna, flowers would rain from the heavens and golden lotuses would well up from the ground. It wouldn't be like my dry and bland explanation which puts my listeners to sleep. The Dharma Purna spoke was the foremost, most subtle and wonderful of Dharmas. He excelled in, in distinguishing the characteristics of all Dharmas. But now, when I hear the wonderful and subtle expression of the Dharma, I am like a deaf person who, at a distance of more than a hundred paces, tries to hear a mosquito, which in fact cannot be seen, let alone heard. His meaning is that someone who is truly deaf, of course, cannot hear such a small sound as a hum of a mosquito if he is more than a hundred paces away from it. You can't even see a mosquito at that distance. This represents the fact that the drama the Buddha speaks is the most subtle and wonderful, wonderful to the ultimate. Therefore, though Purna hears it, because he is in the Dharma assembly, he is like a deaf person. He doesn't understand. So, if there are people in the present who don't understand the sutra, it's no wonder. You see, even Purna, who was foremost in speaking Dharma, had questions and said he didn't understand. In fact, he says he's deaf. Whether you understand or not, you all can at least hear the explanation of the sutra. This is a hundred times better than Purna. Don't be so hard on yourself. When the Buddha spoke the Avatamsaka Sutra, adherents of the two vehicles could not see the thousand foot Nishanda body of the Buddha. Instead, they saw the Buddha as a venerable six foot tall Bishu. When the Buddha spoke the Avatamsaka Sutra, some of his listeners had ears but did not hear the Buddha speaking Dharma. Purna is in a similar situation here. He certainly is not scolding the Buddha, nor is he saying that he does not believe the Dharma the Buddha speaks. It's not that he doesn't believe it. He hasn't understood it. That's what this analogy represents. Some people explain this phrase wonderful and subtle expression of the Dharma as meaning a very small sound. They say that the Buddha spoke the Dharma in a very quiet voice. They say that subtle here means small, but that explanation is not correct. Subtle means rare and esoterically wonderful. It means 
an extremely clear explanation of the Dharma. It certainly does not mean that the Buddha spoke with a soft voice. Some people say, why does Purna compare himself to a mosquito? Because the Buddha spoke the Dharma with such a small voice that Purna felt it was like trying to hear a mosquito at a hundred paces. There are a lot of Dharma masters who swallow the dead hole, so, so to speak. They don't know the flavor of the taste. They explain it like this. Basically, a deaf person can't hear anything, even less can he hear the Buddha speaking Dharma when he speaks with a small voice as the sound of a mosquito. But this rendering of the words of the text is incorrect. Purna is using an analogy. Some people misunderstand the saying, Oh, is Purna slandering the Buddha by calling him a mosquito? That is not the case. You should not have that kind of doubt. In his analogy, Purna likens himself to a deaf person. It's not that he likens the Buddha to a mosquito.